We're honored to have Dr. Julizzi to speak to us tonight. And he is an interventional cardiologist. He has five boards. He's been a little bit of every place. We're happy to have him here. Um, he's going to speak to us tonight on peripheral artery disease. Dr. Julizzi. Let's give him a big hand. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and listening to us. And we um, at the university feel this is an important mission for us to educate our uh, community and get feedback from all of you. Um, the topic that we chose is, is peripheral arterial disease, a very extensive topic. And we're going to limit ourselves today to kind of talking about lower extremity peripheral arterial disease. <laughs> Um, because there's a lot to talk about it. And, and what we're going to try and cover is uh, basically what it is, or what to look out for, what are the risk factors, and what can we do about it, and, and try and keep it uh, 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 so that we have enough time for questions at the end. So if I'm going too fast, just let me know. If I'm going too slow, let me know as well. Thank you so much. So again, uh, prophylactic disease, um, limiting ourselves to lower extremities. So. The most important thing for any disease is, is how common is it? What's the prevalence? And if we look at different studies, and obviously these studies were done at different, different time, time zones, and, and what you'll start noticing is there's something different in each one of these studies, and hence the, the prevalence in the population is different. So if you looked at just people with a cutoff of 40 years, okay, you're going to have about 4.3% of your population with some form of peripheral uh, vascular disease. And if you, if you change your study and you just change it to an older age group, um, your prevalence goes up. You know, that's, 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 that's understandable. And then when you start adding more illnesses like diabetes or smoking, as they did in the Partners 5 trial, you find that almost a third, one in three people, um, will have peripheral arterial disease of some form. And that kind of tells us how important uh, and, in my, my opinion, underdiagnosed this problem is. Um, this is another way of looking at it, and uh, basically just looking at age, and if you look at different studies, the common thing that comes up is as you get older, the chance of having peripheral arterial disease uh, goes up, and when you get into the 85 plus range, you're looking at almost, almost 50% of the population having some form of peripheral vascular disease. So age is an extremely important um, parameter to look for. And again, this is another study looking at the same thing, saying exactly the same thing. Uh, as you get older, peripheral arterial disease is more both in men and in women. Um, initially, men kind of outpace the women, and then eventually uh, they become almost equal. So it's important in both, both sexes. Um, now, why else is peripheral arterial disease important? Well, one is that it is a marker of other illnesses that you'll have. And uh, um, cardiovascular events are more frequent uh, uh, in patients who have ischemic limbs. So not only is it is it important on its own, but it's also important because it's a marker for other illnesses and, and hence uh, becomes a good marker for us. Um, this is another way of looking at what I just said. Um, women kind of lag behind men initially and then kind of catch up. And somebody's probably gonna ask me why in greater than 85 are there more women? Basically because women live longer and hence the prevalence will be higher in the group that lives longer. So, so women catch up and uh, by the time you're more than 85, um, you'll have more women with peripheral arterial disease. If you look at different uh, populations and, and, and race groups, you'll see that uh, there is a disparity to some extent. And that might be the way they sample the size of this population. But blacks and non-Hispanic whites, uh, almost 5 6% of the population will have PAD, uh, Asians with a little bit less. Um, this is probably the, an important slide and shows you how diabetes uh, plays a role in having peripheral arterial disease. So if you're diabetic, almost, almost a quarter of them will have peripheral vascular disease of some form. Doesn't mean it has to be severe, but they will have peripheral vascular disease. And if you are of normal glucose tolerance, that doesn't get you off the hook, but the chance is gonna be less. This is another way of looking at different risk factors that we have. The easy way of looking at the slide is one is where you would be if you, if you didn't have any risk factor. And as you add a risk factor, your relative risk will go up. So smoking is the worst for peripheral vascular disease. And you see that bar is all the way, all the way to the right, almost a relative risk of if you, 
you can say between uh, four and six, and hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, uh, all of them will add risk. And that's taking them individually. When you add in one person multiple risks, that compounds it and your risk goes even higher. So, so things to look out for. Um, this is another way of looking at the same information. It just basically tells you diabetes and smoking outpace everything else, but everything else is important too. So gender is on this extreme and diabetes on this extreme, but all of them um, starting from dyslipidemia is, is past that one, which, which we would take as having no illnesses. So people might ask you, well, I've got so many things. Who, who in the world is more at risk? Well, we can, we can take all the information we just talked about and put it in a couple of words. If you're less than 50 years old and you're diabetic with one other risk factor, any of those on that big list that I just showed you, you are at risk. If you are older than 50 but less than 70, then a history of smoking or diabetes will, will put you at a higher risk. And if you're more than 70, whether you have a risk factor or not, you're at risk, like I showed you on the, as, as you age, your, your, your risk goes up. Um, and of course, at any age, irrespective, if you have abnormal pulses, if you have pain when you walk, um, uh, if you have atherosclerotic disease somewhere else in your heart, in your carotids, uh, um, in your kidney arteries, it's a marker that you will have it in your legs too. So why should we care? I mean, apart from these numbers, why in the world should we care about peripheral arterial disease? You know, it's there. I'll be one of those two out of three that are not going to have it. You know, we, could, we could just think like that. And, and not care about it like we have not for the last two generations or more. But we should care. And, and let me give you some data why, why we should start looking into this. Well, one is this reason. It just doesn't look good, okay? But that's not the reason we go after these illnesses. It's, it, this is a gangrenous foot. Um, the, the, this is the big toe. And you see a lot of chronic changes and it's, it's gangrened off this toe, which will eventually fall off because there's not enough blood supply there. But that's not the only reason we're doing this. If you look at uh, multiple studies, you start to realize how many people can, are at risk of amputation. And when you have an amputation, it changes the quality of your life. So there was a study more than 10 years ago uh, where um, we found that almost 50% of the patients who had an amputation didn't really have a vascular workup. So they never had an opportunity to fix the problem or, or improve it or, or modify it. Um, uh, even back then, the estimates were that we're looking at 150,000 amputations in that one study. We're looking at, back then, 270 million price tag. And it's, it, it's obviously gone up as, as, uh, um, uh, as the inflation has gone up. But what the most important thing is, is the last point that these studies make that comprehensive foot programs can reduce your amputation by more than half. So there is something we can do, and that's why we care. There's, there's something that we can do about it. It's another example of an ulcer. Um, you might have seen this in some of your friends or colleagues. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an ulcer because of poor blood flow and it's not healing, and eventually will get worse uh, and could lead to amputation. At the same time, it can improve, and we'll, we'll show you that. Same thing, a gangrene on, on this toe turned it black, and uh, uh, this person had peripheral arterial disease in the legs. What are we concerned about? Well, peripheral arterial disease to a lot of people is just my legs ache. Well, they could ache from anything. But what we're really concerned about is what we call CLI, or critical limb ischemia. And basically, this is the the extreme point of what we're trying to avoid. So we're looking at rest pain, we're looking at tissue loss, we're looking at ulceration like I just showed you that's not healing. Uh, we're looking at recurrent pain, uh, patient requiring pain medicines for the, for the non-healing ulcers and, and pain in their legs. So we're, we're trying to avoid getting to that point. So what will happen with chronic lingual ischemia, why, 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 why not wait till it gets to that point and then fix it? Well, the reason is 20% of the patients who get to chronic lingual ischemia are gonna die. So for 20% of the patients, you're too late. They're gonna die. For another 35% of the patients, they're gonna end up with amputations. So you've helped them, but not really helped them. I mean, they are, you've changed, affected their quality of life. And the other 45% will progress depending on how you treat them. So, so it's, it's, 
you do not want to get to chronic limb ischemia or critical limb ischemia. You, you want to get to them sooner than that. Some of us in the audience are going to be economists and, 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 and look at this more carefully than I do. But these are the estimates that we have. We've got baby boomers uh, reaching 65 plus in the next 20 years. And this will increase the overall population at risk by almost 20%. And we're going to look at almost 10 million plus people who are going to have peripheral arterial disease. By 2050, the estimates are the US population is going to be up to 400 million. And imagine 20% of the population with 400 million. We're talking about a lot of people. Um, 19 million is what they're estimating. This is another way of looking at what is going to happen for vascular disease in this country. It's a growing problem. Uh, it's almost catching up to coronary artery disease that we all um, um, familiar with. Um, but the problem with peripheral arterial disease is it's underappreciated, underdiagnosed, and hence undertreated. And that's one of the purposes why we want to spread this awareness. Now, you might think, and, and this is the biggest problem we have, even amongst physicians, even us physicians, and we're at fault, think it's not important. It's, it's not that, that critical. But if you really look at the numbers, we all think colorectal cancer is, is, is a horrible diagnosis. Almost 39% of the patients won't be alive, uh, or actually 39% of the patients will, will, will die at five years of diagnosis. That's a pretty big number. But if you look at the very next number, peripheral arterial disease, 30% of people will not be alive in five years after their diagnosis. And that just puts things in perspective. What are we dealing with? And compare that to stroke, which we all feel is, is a horrible disease, or coronary artery disease that we have made so much progress in, 20% um, 20, 20, 20 on coronary artery disease. And breast cancer, which fortunately gets good um, support from the community, we brought it down to 14% uh, over five-year mortality risk. So 14% of patients diagnosed will die versus almost 40% for colorectal cancer and 30% for peripheral arterial disease. So it's an important disease, and that's, that's why we care. We care because a lot of us will be part of that, or one in three of us will be part of that group. Now, if you start looking at patients, say, day one, day zero, and we do peripheral arterial testing, and we find that they are normal, and we track them over a decade or more, you see, normal patients will survive. On the other extreme, look at people with severe symptoms of peripheral arterial disease, maybe in the group that we call the critical limb ischemia. See how the yellow line just drops dramatically at about that five-year mark that we talked about. It drops from the start, but see their survival is down here. It's almost less than 20% are surviving. So, so it's an important disease based on where you are, what stage you're at. But they're all important. Even, even patients who have peripheral arterial disease and don't have a lot of symptoms aren't doing as well as the normal subjects. There's a, there's a huge gap between these two lines, an even worse gap once you start getting symptoms. So again, Important, important. Um, this again says the same thing in a different way. And this is a natural history. So natural history means we're not intervening, we're not doing anything, we're just watching. Watching what they're doing. And if you look at peripheral arterial disease, there's a, there's a steep downward trend. And if you start looking at, at how many of these will get myocardial infarctions, how many of them will end up with more interventions, meaning either surgical or non-surgical treatments, and how many will get amputations? You see, over time, everything goes up. So we'll do it like a, kind of a flow diagram here. So you've got a PAD population, and we're going to just choose the people over 50. And we're going to say they presented with whatever they presented with, some symptoms of peripheral arterial disease, we're going to be able to split them into several categories. Some are going to be really no disease. Some doctor kind of did a screening test and kind of picked them up. Some people had some leg pain, but you know, it wasn't something that they were, that was typical. Um, 
uh, for peripheral arterial disease, or they had typical symptoms, basically, I walk, it hurts, I stop, it goes away. I walk again, I can reproduce it, I stop again, it goes away. A simple, what we call intermittent claudication, or the stuff we don't want to get to, which is critical limb ischemia, which about 2% of patients will have the first time they meet a provider. And unfortunately, you'll still have about 2 to 3% of patients in, in that group that we don't want to see. So with the critical limb, is, limb ischemia, 50% of them will be alive with both their limbs, both their legs. 25% will have some form of amputation. And a quarter of them, like we talked in the previous slides, will die from some form of cardiovascular mortality, either a heart attack, a stroke, something in their legs, or something else associated with it. So bad diagnosis up front. The asymptomatics will probably progress over the next five years. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. The ones who are complaining of their pain when they walk, they'll, they will probably be alive in five years because they didn't have an open sore or open limb or, or an um, open ulcer or anything. So let's see what happens to those guys. So at five years, you're again talking about what's happening to the limb. So we're just talking about what the limb or what's happening overall to the person. And on the limb side, we're talking about they might just stay stable. So they say, yeah, my legs hurt. It's hurt for five years. It keeps hurting, maybe a little bit worse, but it might be my arthritis, but they're stable. Others will say, I could walk 50 feet last year. Now I can walk 20. So it's worsening claudication. Or they might say, now I've developed an ulcer and my ulcer won't heal. And it's been there and it weeps and oozes and I'm miserable. So they progressed. And now those people with, the, or with pain at rest without even moving around have, have moved up their illness to a different category that we talked about, uh, critical limb ischemia. And that's the same thing that we saw on the last slide. So when patients come to us, or when you start evaluating yourself, what are the kind of things you want to be thinking about? Well, one is what is your typical activity level? If you're the kind of person who just walks around the house, are you able to do that? If you're the kind of person who goes out and walks to the mailbox and further, are you able to do that? Or if you're a walker and you go and walk, are you able to do that? And when you do do that, are you getting pain in your calf, in your thigh, in your buttocks or, or hip area? Are you having pain when you're trying to climb up the steps? And pain that you don't think is from arthritis, don't think is from your joints. We're talking about more muscle pain. Um, can you describe how the pain comes on, how the pain goes off? And if, if you can kind of relate to those things, you, you really help evaluation. And probably a really important thing is, do you have any sores, skin ulcerations? I see so many people go to the doctor's office, don't take their shoes off. You'd be surprised people come into our offices who've not, take, not looked at their own feet and you got a nail sticking in there. It sounds, it's impossible, but it does happen because the sensations are down, you've injured it, you've, you've worn a bad shoe, you got an ulcer and you haven't noticed it because you didn't feel it. And that ulcer got worse and worse and then started smelling and that's when you realize, my God, what's going on? So, so ulcers and changes in, in break in skin, extremely important to look at. Um, and then you have changes in color and temperature, appearance of the skin, and, 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 and men can have impotence as well. Not necessarily a sign of peripheral arterial disease, but something to, to consider. So is every pain peripheral arterial disease? No, it's not. So, so uh, this is a very simple format of seeing whether it's uh, uh, to kind of figure out whether, hey, I have PAD, hey, I don't, or, or for the doctors to figure out. So, so probably the most important thing is PAD pain is exercise-induced, while other causes not. The distance to pain is about the same each time. It's not like today I could walk a mile and tomorrow I can't walk to the bathroom, okay? Claudication doesn't happen that way. Um, but if it's a consistent pain, I can walk 10 minutes, five minutes, two minutes, I get pain. If you make me walk today two minutes, I'll get pain again. And when I rest, the pain will go away. Pain will not disappear when you, uh, when you, when you stand up, okay? Pain will go away when you stop. So just standing up to make the pain go away or turning around in bed making the pain go away, that's not peripheral arterial disease. It's actually a physiological. When you use it more, you hurt more. When you stop, you're gonna hurt less, okay? 
Um, these are some other signs we just talked about. Cool, dry, atrophic skin, some muscle weakness. If you're not going to be walking, your legs are going to get weaker. Ulcers, wounds, and gangrene, the black toe that I showed you. So all things to kind of think about. Hey, maybe I have arterial insufficiency. Now, what can you do about this? Well, testing, unfortunately, is part and parcel of modern medicine. But in peripheral arterial disease, most of the testing is very simple. Um, we'll talk about the most important ones to me, and I'll mention the others. So ABI is basically ankle brachial index, and I'll, we'll go into details on this. Um, an exercise with ABI, some pressure measurements in the different parts of your legs, ultrasound, and MRA. You've probably heard of MRI. So MRA is just in geography with magnetic resonance and CT in geography. And then the last one is actually doing an invasive test where you put a catheter inside and take pictures of your legs with, with dye and uh, fluoroscopy. So in geography that you probably heard of. Um, so again, the, for, for, I often give this to physicians. The history is the most important. The physical exam is extremely important. Questions about uh, your lifestyle and, and risk factors and then testing. And then a decision whether anything more needs to be done or not. Now, this is just a premier to what ABI is, and I just want you to remember this, just, just that if you have a bad ABI, which is out here in gray, which is this line, you are worse than if you have a normal ABI. That's all I need you to remember. So, worse ABI, worse um, uh, survival, okay? Now, ABI sounds like a fancy word, but it's really a very simple test. I think everyone in this room has had a blood pressure taken at the doctor's office. And that's exactly what it is. You measure the blood pressure in your brachium, which is your arm, and you take a blood pressure in your ankle. And you divide the two. And the blood pressures in both your ankle and your arm should be the same. And if they are not the same, then there's a problem somewhere. So if your blood pressure in your arm is 120, the upper number, systolic, and your ankle is 120, great. You don't have, you don't have any significant peripheral arterial disease. It's normal. Okay, simple test, not done, unfortunately, not done. Very simple test, very good data on it. So here again, you, you, you probably, all of you, all of us have had this done, except with the stethoscope. You know, blow up cuff, measure the pressure. Well, you do the same thing at the leg, that's all. You can do it in the doctor's office, you can do it in a specialized way, in, in a more fancy uh, testing area, and that's all you're doing. And you're dividing the two numbers, and the answer should be one or close to one uh, for, for you to say there's no significant blockage in these legs. It's a very simple screen to prevent all those horrible things. Some people have calcified arteries down here. So these little tiny blood pressure cuffs on the toes, a little fancy way of doing it. Don't have to do it, only in very few people. Um, so again, toe bra brachial index, same thing, toe pressures and the brachium. And these are the values. Um, 1 to 1.3 almost is normal. These are borderline. When you go down to about 0.5, you're talking about real disease. And then less than 0.4 signifying severe disease. So let's take an easy number. The, the arm is 200. The leg is uh, 100. It's already 0.5. There's a difference. Okay. So, so you're already thinking about, hey, this, we may have peripheral arterial disease. And that's how we do it. We, we talk about segmental pressures. You put cuffs, different parts of the ankle, and you see the measurement. And then this is up here, the, the up in the arm, and you see 150 there, 60 there. You know there's a problem. You know there's a blood flow problem. That's why it's not 150. 150 or 150 would have been one. It would have been great, but you're half of that. So, so very simple screen, very simple screen. And some people, Everything looks good, but the story is good. And that's why the story is so important. If the story is good, you can make them walk and repeat the test. And sometimes it will come back positive after simple walking, just like that on a treadmill. If you can't, don't have a treadmill, you can just make them just, just go up and down on their toes and reproduce some symptoms and repeat the ABI, and that might be positive. It's inexpensive. It can be performed anywhere. Um, Often patients will ask me, well, how long will it take? It's going to take too much of my time away. Well, they actually did a study on that. They actually sat down 
and they went to different institutions and different responders and found out the majority of people get an ABI done in less than 15 minutes. So it's, it's really not a long test. It's not an expensive test. It can be done in the doctor's office. You know, you don't need any great fancy equipment. Even the equipment we use in the hospital is not, you know, it's, 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 it's simple equipment, you know, measuring blood pressures. There's some limitations to it. I'm going to skip that. Uh, uh, basically, the biggest uh, limitation is, is incompressible vessels where they're so hard and calcified, you really can't get a good blood pressure. And then you have alternative ways of testing it. We do add more to um, uh, ABIs by adding a little bit more uh, volume recordings and stuff. Again, just another way of adding more to it. And then we already talked about these things. So the American Diabetic Association consensus panel um, a long time ago suggested back in 03 that patients who are diabetic and over 50 years of age should consider a screening test for uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, patients with diabetes who are younger than 50 and if they have another risk factors like, like smoking or hypertension or dyslipidemia uh, should consider just a screening ABI. Um, and then if it's normal and you still have risk factors or worsening risk factors, consider repeating it in five to seven years and, and see if that's changed or not. Um, the other test that you can do is a simple uh, anatomical test with an ultrasound. So nothing goes in, it's everything's from the outside. And you see whether there's any anatomical problems with ultrasound waves, sound waves. You can do an MRA, which is a picture on the far left. Basically the yellow shows there's a break in the vasculature um, and you, there's peripheral arterial disease there. It has certain limitations. Patients don't like going in some of the MRI uh, cameras because of claustrophobia. Um, there's this um, uh, pace, the older pacemakers and defibrillators you can't go into MRI, MRA machines uh, um, and you know some weight limitations as well. But a useful test. This is CT angiography again. Um, um, another way of of looking at peripheral arteries and you can see that there is a, a tube here and a tube up here and something's missing in between. And same on this side, you got a tube, some calcium here and then this part is really faint and then you got an artery up here. So uh, it gives us pretty good pictures. Unfortunately it has x-ray radiation and uses contrast. But it can give you decent pictures and uh, tell you more about it. Um, this again, same thing, we talked about this before. Uh, chronic limb ischemia. This is mortality just based on the plain simple test, the ABI, the ankle brachial index in patients with diabetes. And as you can see that if you have a bad ABI, which is, they were very generous. They just said anything bad. They didn't go moderate, severe or anything. Anything bad, just less than 0.9. One being normal, like I said, they will do poorly. If you're diabetic, it's the incidence of uh, death per thousand patients. So that's 65 yeah. of a thousand patients will get into trouble just because they're diabetic and they had a poor ABI. So it's a good screening tool to say how you're gonna do. A lot of options for treatment. Um, you have the percutaneous options, which are good for certain patients, and you have the surgical options, which are better for other patients. And sometimes it has to be a combination of the two options. Um, so percutaneously, what I mean, you go through a catheter and you go in, take your pictures of your legs. This is your leg, this is your belly. This is a catheter in your, usually in your common femoral artery, and you can look at both legs. And this is also the leg from heel to groin. And uh, this person requires a bypass that bypasses all the blockages. But what is the cornerstone of treatment? Well, the cornerstone of treatment is not angioplasty or stenting or surgery. The cornerstone of treatment is medical therapy. And off the medical therapy, the most important thing is risk factor modification. So if you're a diabetic, you wanna treat that. If you use tobacco, you gotta to stop that. If you have any other risk factors, you gotta bring them to the best treatment possible. The next most important thing is a walking program. And a walking program is very simple. You walk till it hurts, then you stop. When the pain goes away, you get up and you walk again. You walk till it hurts and you stop. And you time yourself for the time that you walked, not the time that you rested, okay? 
And over time, you'll be able to improve your exercise distance. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to create natural collaterals in your legs so that the blood flow improves. And, and, and walking uh, is extremely important uh, in achieving that, no matter what type of treatment you get. If you walk, you save your legs. The other part of the medical therapy is drug therapy, and most of this is a combination of things, but uh, blood thinners like aspirin, um, like um, a platel or celestazole, plavix and blood thinners, but also statin therapies can help improve the cholesterol makeup of your, uh, of your plaque burden, blood pressure control. So medical therapy is multi-pronged. If you've done all the medical therapy and you still have symptoms, so again, medical therapy, risk factor modification first. If you still have symptoms and you have abnormal ABIs, then you can proceed to imaging and then decide what else can be done. Well, endovascular, meaning through that catheter, you can have angioplasty, you can have stenting, you can have arthrectomy, basically that removes plaque. And if you have a clot in there, you can have more medical therapy. Surgically, you can have bypass grafts, which are usually made of veins. It can also be a prosthetic material. Unfortunately, those who fail can end up with amputations. Uh, and you can also have open arterectomy, end arterectomy, meaning basically open the vessel and take the plaque out. Um, so a lot of options. This is just a slide I put in just to show that if you're able to walk more, which would be these folks, you do better even if you take four, just split it into four quartiles. So physical activity actually affects mortality, not just simply how you feel. It actually affects how long you live. So just a simple chart showing that. This is another way of showing what we're talking about. We're talking about here with just angioplasty, we're talking about a stent in there to kind of keep that angioplasty open. We're talking about uh, arthrectomy where you actually take this plaque out. So this yellow is actually taken out and you get, um, these two probably are the most, this is used in everybody to kind of open up a vessel. These two kind of a, a combination or complementary to each other, um, depending on what the problem is. So this is the same slide that I showed earlier uh, in my talk, uh, le uh, ulcer, non-healing. It's a 91 year old with a lot of risk factors, uh, interestingly non-diabetic, so, but she had a lot of other risk factors. And initially was recommended limb amputation because this was not healing for a long time. But after angioplasty, stenting, taking the plaque out, a lot of good medical therapy, physical therapy, walking program, it actually healed. It actually healed. And that's the same spot, it's healing. Um, this is again just showing um, if you can just make out this vessel here, kind of just not, you can't see it, and this is after working on it. Um, so you can see a, a, almost like a road coming back. This is that same toe that I showed you earlier. It was from an 83 year old smoker with bad ABIs, so ankle brachial index, who had leg pain at rest and exercised both. And uh, the, the wound would not heal with, with good therapy, with medical therapy, with, with everything they did non invasively. And it can heal, it can heal. This is um, probably not projecting as well. It's just showing you that, the, as, as, and I just wanted to show you that the arteries as you go down below the knee actually become much smaller than they are higher up above the knee. And actually one big artery will then split into three arteries as we go down the leg. And this just shows that we worked and did arthrectomy on, on these vessels, even though they are small, they're important because they're supplying all the way down here. Uh, tough to treat anything below the knee, but it's, you know, the idea in below the knee work is basically improve flow so you can get healing. And if you can get healing, then the walking program will kick in. Uh, and that's just to, to the, the, and hence, I keep saying this again and again, the, the medical part is essential, is essential to anything that we do. And because you don't want it looking pretty today, and then the person doesn't walk and you're back to square one, back to square one or worse. This is just uh, another device that we use to kind of go in and, and cut. It's got a little cutter over there. It tries to pack all that atheroma into this cone and we can actually excise it. This is one of our patients here at Berkeley Medical Center that we 
took atheroma out of the femoral artery, the superficial femoral artery, uh, quite a bit of it, good relief of symptoms, is actually walking uh, in a walking program and doing reasonably well. Um, other devices can be used when arteries are completely blocked, they're very difficult to open. Once, once they are blocked, they become calcified and hard. So you want to get to them before they're completely blocked because if the success rate is dependent on whether, even if there's a trickle through it, that we can get a wire through. Once they're blocked, the body tries to form natural collaterals, the main vessel is blocked, and um, it's, it's much tougher. So a couple more slides. This is one of our recent patients, and this was the slide that I put up initially. I'm just gonna go over what it is. This is, this is your pelvis, and this would be where your bladder would be, and this is, uh, is higher, and you see your aorta come down, and then you see this little nub, and on the other side, you see this vessel, and it goes down. So you're starting to wonder what, what is going on. It should be like a trouser with, with two limbs, and you're just seeing one. And this gentleman had a lot of aches and pains in the buttock, uh, decreased uh, uh, exercise capacity. But the point I wanted to make was he was never picked up as peripheral arterial disease, even with that severe a stenosis. He came in with a heart attack. He came in with a heart attack, and we rushed him to the lab with our STEMI program, and we realized that his groin pulses were very poor. And we took a big, quick picture when we went from the left side and saw that he had no flow in the right leg. And we finished his work and we went ahead and we did angioplasty and stenting to the right heart artery. And uh, we put him on medications and got him to walk and everything and he just couldn't walk from his bed to the front door, miserable. And we tried that for six, eight weeks, he quit tobacco use, he started on medications for everything, but he was still quite miserable despite medical therapy. So we brought him back and we worked on his leg. It was a long procedure and this is the same gentleman. We ended up putting two stents, we opened up this area and this is the same vessel and now he's got the two limbs of his trouser. He actually came back and did a treadmill stress test with us uh, a couple of weeks ago and walked 15 minutes on the treadmill. A gentleman who couldn't walk from his bedroom to the front door. And he is trying to stay away from tobacco. And we told him that if he wants to keep this open, medical therapy is essential. Otherwise, we'll be back to square one. So not everyone gets these great results, but a lot of people do. Thank you.